Hi there, my name is Jennifer Morrissey. I'm the Executive Director of the Mission Trails Regional Park Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to the second in our new series called On Topic, and the, um, it's a new series of online lectures. Tonight, we're going to explore iNaturalist, or iNat, with Millie Baisden. Before we get started, I wanted to just take a minute to tell you a bit about the foundation. The Mission Trails Regional Park Foundation was founded in 1988 as a 501c3 nonprofit to preserve, protect, and enhance Mission Trails Regional Park. Since then, we have helped make the park what it is today. Uh, we have funded or contributed significantly to a range of projects, from the building of the visitor center and the new ranger station, to restoring sensitive habitat and supporting educational programs such as this lecture series. As you consider your charitable giving, we hope that you'll consider making a gift to support the park and the foundation. I'd like to thank our speaker, Millie Baisden, and two supporters of this evening's presentation, SDG&E, a longtime educational partner of the foundation, and uh, Finest City Entertainment, who are helping us with the technical aspects of the lecture. Tonight's speaker, Millie Baisden, is a former attorney who has been a Mission Trails Regional Park trail guide since 2001. In normal times, Millie co-leads a monthly bird walk at Mission Trails. She also serves as the editor of the Trail Guide's monthly publication, Trail Talk. Millie joined the iNat or iNaturalist community in 2016, and since that time, she has gained significant knowledge in its workings. She has more than 20,000 iNat observations, 15,000 identifications for others, and participates in 60 different iNat projects. Thank you for joining us tonight, Millie. And um, just for those of you in the audience, wanted to let you know you can pose any questions anytime and we will have um, Millie will be answering them at the close of the talk. Thanks so much and welcome Millie. Thank you and good evening everyone. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to switch screens to my slideshow so you won't be seeing me anymore. You'll see the slides and it will take me just a second here to, to bring that up. Oops. You know, there's never been a better time than right now to be an active participant on a iNaturalist. I'm an unabashed iNaturalist enthusiast, and I'd like to share with you some tips for getting the most from iNaturalist. The observations you post to iNaturalist are important. Not only can you learn a lot about nature, but your observations can contribute to science. Tonight, I want to show you ways to improve your observations so that you get the most benefit from them and so that your observations provide the most benefit to science. This is my profile page on iNAT, and I'm showing it to you for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is my first tip. If you haven't completed your profile page on iNAT, you should. This is a place where other members of the iNAT community can get to know a little bit about you, your interests, your background. The other reason I want to show you my profile page is that I have posted on it links to the resources that I'll be mentioning this evening. So during the presentation, you don't need to write down URLs or otherwise try to remember how to get to a resource. After the presentation, you can go to my iNAT profile page and you'll find the links there. And if you don't know how to find an iNAT profile page, don't worry, I'll show you that later in the presentation. Now, many people know iNAT as an app, an application that they download to their phone or their smart device, and they use that out in the field to upload observations. And for some people, that's the only way they interact with iNAT. But iNaturalist is also a website, and the website has features that the, that the app does not have. Tonight, we're going to focus on the website. The primary goal of iNat is to connect people to nature. And with all of its amazing growth, I think it's clear iNat is succeeding in that goal. With over 50 million observations of over 300,000 species, with over 1 million people participating, 
INET has truly become a global database with observations uploaded by people from all over the world. The secondary goal of INET is to generate scientifically valuable biodiversity data. And this is the, the thing that really drives my participation in INAT. And I'm happy to say that I think they're succeeding here also. Here's one example of, of a publication from a, a Ecology Letters that relied on INAT observations in the research. They looked at the color in the wings of the male blue dasher dragonfly. This photo is from one of my observations, and this was included in this study. The, in this photo, the, the dragonfly has just a tiny bit of orange at the base of the wings, but in other areas of its range, they found that the wings had extensive orange in them, and they'd concluded that this was uh, related to the climate, and in colder areas, the dragonflies have more color, which allows them to absorb the sun's rays and warm up quicker and then be active sooner than they would otherwise be. So this is just one example of a publication using INAT data, but there's lots of them now. Here in San Diego, the Natural History Museum is using INAT observations to better understand the plants and animals of our area. This is the uh, map that shows the distribution range of the granite spiny lizard. This is from the amphibian and reptile atlas that's online, uh, hosted by the San Diego Natural History Museum. The red markers show you the location of the scientific specimens that have been collected of this lizard. The blue markers show you all the INAT observations of the lizard. So you can see that it's filling in more data points, more information about where the lizard can be found. Over time, with changes like droughts and wildfires, climate change, development, this sort of information can be invaluable to track the impact on a, on a species such as a lizard. Right here in Mission Trails Regional Park, we're learning more about the plants and animals in the park. Here's an observation I posted back in 2017 of a plant, and I thought this was one of the common plants in the park called clustered tarweed. But when John Redman, the curator of botany at the San Diego Natural History Museum looked at it, he said, no, this isn't that common plant, it's San Diego tarweed. And he left me a note telling me how to tell it apart and also that this was a location that the plant was not known to occur in the county. It was thought to be farther north in the county. So because of this INAT observation, and then subsequently a, a specimen of the plant was collected and um, examined at the herbarium, we now know that this plant grows in a different area of San Diego than we knew before, and it will be added to the checklist of the plants in Mission Trails. We've also learned about invasive pests in the park. Here's a, a channeled apple snail observation that I posted in 2016. Shortly after I posted it, I was contacted by the collection manager for snails from the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. He asked for more information and for assistance in obtaining a specimen to document the presence of this um, species in the park. I've used my observations as examples, but I want to stress that your observations will also generate scientifically valuable data. You never know what you're going to find. I didn't go out looking for something special or unique or rare or of special significance. Just, I just went out and made observations. And likewise, as you do observations, and the more you do, the more likely it is that you'll have experiences similar to mine. You may have seen this newspaper article just in the last couple of weeks on the front page of the San Diego Union Tribune discussing iNaturalists and specifically talking about this observation of alligator weed that was posted by Jorge Aon. Before this observation was posted and Dr. Redman identified it, it was not known to be in the county at all. It's an invasive species. And so the hope is that now that it's known to be at this location, it can be eradicated before it spreads widely in our county. Because our observations are important, 
we should all adopt best practices as we upload observations and as we make identifications of our own observations and of observations of others. So how do you do that? How do you optimize your observations? Well, I'm going to list a, a few ways here, and then we'll look at them more carefully. First of all, take clear photos of necessary features. Use the optional fields that att attach to every observation, so things like description, comment, annotations, observation fields. Add your observations to relevant projects and apply the most precise ID that you can. To know what are the necessary features to take photos of, the Natural History Museum produced this pamphlet. And if we were meeting in person tonight, I would be passing these out for you. But since we aren't, I will show you instead how to find it online. Um, but first, let me show you what it contains. So you can see it here folded up and then opened out the front and the back. There's one column about taking photographs, so it gives some hints for how to get good photos. And then there's a column for plants, birds, insects, reptiles, and amphibians, and mammals. And under each of those, it gives you suggestions. And these were um, suggestions from the curators of the different departments uh, telling you what features are necessary for identification. The one thing that is kind of a recurring theme in, in each column is that it's rarely adequate to have just one photo. Typically, you need to have photos from different angles, um, some that are of closer, closer up and some farther back to have more of the organism or less in, in the frame. I urge you to review this pamphlet and other resources, which uh, there are links on my profile page, both for this pamphlet and for other resources that help you to know what necessary features are for different categories of organisms. To find it online, you go to the Natural History Museum website to the Learn and Explore tab, and under that, Community Science. And then on that page, you'll find down a little ways the Quick Guide to iNaturalist PDF. Click on that, and it will open up, and you can browse it online or print it out. Now, to talk about those other optional fields, I want to go directly to the iNaturalist website and demonstrate them to you. So to do that, I'm going to be switching screens again. And you will, for just um, a moment here, uh, you will see me again. There I am, and now I need to um, make another choice here to get over to the internet. And I think that I have just about guided. Sorry about that, it took me a while. Okay, now I'm on the internet here on the iNaturalist website. You can see that, that the green bar is under Explore tab, so I'm uh, I'm on just someone's observation. I'm going to click Explore and just go to the general <clears throat> page of observations. The first thing that I want to show you is how to find my profile. So on any INAP page, up in the upper left corner, you can see that there's a search box right next to where it says iNaturalist. There is a, a, block, a white box that says search. If you type my name, Millie, is all you need to type. M-I-L-L-I-E, and you'll get a bunch of choices. You skip over all the millipedes, and then you'll come to my name, Millie Basden. You click on About, and that takes you to my profile. When you get to my profile, if you just go down a little ways, you'll see resources and the links. In some cases, it's not an online publication, and so it just tells you things that I, I like to use that are in print. Uh, but you'll you can find links to the things that I'm not right there. There are other ways to get to a profile page, but that is one of the, the simpler ways. Under community, one of the other tabs up in the top menu bar, there's a people choice, and that also takes you to a search box. If you type Millie in that search box and click search, it will bring up everyone's profile um, username that has Millie in it. I'm at the top of the list on that. So again, you click on my name and it takes you to my profile page. So 
hopefully you can remember that to get there to look for those resources. You have to think about remembering them tonight. Now, I also want to just point out a couple of other things before we go to those optional fields. I'm just going to pick an observation at random here. One of the things that I think we should all do when we upload observations is to double check the date and time that is usually automatically put in for you from your phone or your camera. Sometimes, if, for example, with a camera, you may not have the time set properly on your camera. That happens to lots of us. So you may, the time may be off and it may even throw the day off. So you want to be sure that, that the time and date are right. And then you want to check the location on the map and be sure that if, you're, if the location was provided through the GPS coordinates of your device, that it actually did grab the right coordinates. Because I find often um, I may have in a series of you know, 10, 15, 20 observations, most of them may have the right location, but, but all of a sudden one of them will be way off. And so you have to, you may have to zoom in using the zoom button to see if the location is marked correctly. And if it is not correct, you can go into edit and change the location by moving that marker. Um, another thing about location to be aware of, and that is obscured coordinates. And actually, in order to show you what I mean about obscured coordinates, I'm going to bring up observations for a um, least fells vireo, which I know is an endangered species. And so the coordinates, the true coordinates of observations of least fells vireo will be obscured. Now, if I find my own observation like this one here, I'm going to go to that. You can see that we can all see exactly where I saw that least fells vireo by this marker. But that's because I'm logged in and it's my observation. If I go back to that list of all the least fells vireos and I go to someone else's observation, not my own, you see that big box, that big rectangular box that's on the map. And then there's a, a large blue circle or dot, if you want to call it that. This is what an obscured coordinate looks like. And if you see that, it means that you cannot, you don't have access to the information of the true coordinates of that observation. The observation was somewhere in the box. And that blue dot has been randomly placed. And, and to the extent that the coordinates are shown under the details here, if you click on details and it gives you coordinates, that's the coordinates of that dot. But it's been randomly assigned. So you don't know where this observation was made, except that it was somewhere in that box. OK, that's all I want to show you on that. But let's go on and talk about the community of iNaturalists. This is an aspect that a lot of people don't understand. If you've participated in other citizen science databases, such as eBird or Bug Guide or some of those, there there's more of a hierarchy. Uh, amateurs upload observations and experts identify them. That's not the way INAT works. On INAT, both amateurs and experts upload observations and both make identifications. And there's really, there's no weight given to the identification made by an expert. Now, a lot of people don't agree that that's the way it ought to be, but that is the way it is. But I want to emphasize the community nature of INAT. We are incredibly fortunate that we have so many experts who are involved in the community and who willingly give their time to identify our observations. And this is just a, a smattering of names and, and areas of specialty. Um, it's one of the things that has just really sold me on INAD because I'm so amazed by the feedback that I get from sometimes the world's expert on some organism. Another part of being involved in the community of INAT and the way that you can really have a stronger connection to that community is through the INAT forum. Now, the forum is actually a different website, and you have to establish an account there. You get to it on any INAT page under the Community tab, 
or if you go to the very bottom of any INAP page, there's a link there to the forum, and it's just called Forum. Um, at the forum, there are categories of topics. You can post uh, a new topic. You can join a conversation that's already ongoing. You can just read the conversations without actually interacting yourself. You can search for topics that are of interest to you. But I urge you to go there and just scroll through and look at what's available. The staff sometimes post updates. Um, people who are having problems will ask for help, and you can, you know, you'll find things there that you yourself have struggled with, and that that tell you how better to deal with them. So the forum is a very good way to be more involved in the community and to get more out of those, um, out of the ability to communicate with other INAT users. Along with that, I think it's really important that we all check our observations for comments. Some people upload their observations and then they sort of walk away and never look back. And I think that's a real mistake. I think they miss out on a lot uh, that they would benefit from. Sometimes comments are things that you really ought to respond to. Now, the appropriate response may be no response, um, but other times you may want to withdraw an ID or change an ID, or you may want to provide some feedback. You may want to ask questions. My main point is just to pay attention, look at your notifications, and if you see that someone has added a comment to an observation, check it out and respond as appropriate. Now, when I started using INAT, I thought that I couldn't do identifications because I'm not an expert in anything. But I quickly learned, and now I feel that as a member of the community, it's sort of my responsibility to help with identifications. And we can all do that because there are a lot of identif a lot of observations that get uploaded that are not identified at all. So they're they're unknowns. They that's the the identification on them is unknown. It helps to have a high level ID added to those observations. So you go through them and you label it plant or mammal or insect or fungus. It doesn't have to be a very specific ID, but by getting it out of the unknown category and into some uh, level of ID, it helps to get those observations to the attention of people who do know that area. Yeah, if it stays an unknown, it's not likely to be seen by someone who specializes in plants, for example, if it's a plant. So any of us can do that, and I urge you to give it a try, even if you think that you aren't able to identify things, because I think that as you do that, you will also begin to see that you recognize things and that there are other identifications that you can add on INAT. As you start doing that, though, there's one word of caution that I have, and that is the Agree button. On all observations, once one identification has been made, there's a button that you can click that says you agree. A lot of people look at that button almost as a way to thank someone who has posted an ID on their observation. Or once they see an ID, they think, well, I should agree with it. And they don't really know whether it's correct or not. We really should all use that agree button only if we can independently look at the observation and say, yes, that's the right identification. Now, to help getting over any any uh, hesitation you have about doing identifications, there's help to, to uh, give you confidence that you can. There's a wiki, and this is a screenshot just of the top part of the wiki. It's on the forum, and there's a link to it on my profile page. The, the wiki is a, a document where lots of different INAT users have posted their hints and their suggestions for how to deal with different situations dealing with identifications. So I urge you to go to the wiki and read it, even if you don't plan to do identifications. It explains a lot about how identifications work. So it helps you to understand with your own observations what's going on with identifications. Um, but it definitely will help you to feel better about identifying other people's observations if you read through this wiki. And again, link on my profile page. 
Now, as much as I love iNaturalist, it's not perfect. I have to admit that. They introduced the artificial intelligence or computer vision, whatever you want to call it, a few years ago. And it sometimes can seem almost uncanny how good it is. But overall, the AI suggestions are only 60 to 80% accurate. If it's prefaced with the, we're pretty sure it's in this category, the suggestions, the suggestion in that um, we're pretty sure is about 95% accurate. I'll show you what I mean. This is the screenshot of an upload page uh, where I've posted the photo of a plant taken in San Diego County. I placed my cursor in the species name or ID box and got this drop down menu of suggestions. The first gray box says, we're pretty sure this is in the tribe, followed by sunflowers and allies. That suggestion is 95% accurate. Under that, in the next gray bar, it says, here are our top species of suggestions. And there it says uh, a list of species um, from different um, genera. Those are 60 to 80% accurate. And I have to tell you that for this particular plant, um, the one in the photo, that list of students is 0% accurate. It, that plant is not in that list. Well, you may be saying, well, why not? Why don't they fix the AI so that it has the right plant in it, in the, in the list? They trained the AI or the computer vision using research grade observations. And there have to be at least 150 research grade observations before the computer vision is trained to recognize the organism. This particular plant, even though it's not rare, uh, it's not real common, and it's up mainly in the mountains, but um, there haven't been 150 research grade observations of the plant. So as far as the computer vision goes, that plant does not exist. So you have to be careful as you are choosing an ID about relying on the computer vision. Um, if you don't know what it is and you get one of those, we're pretty sure it's in this category suggestions, that's pretty safe to select. But if all you get are a list of here are our top species suggestions, and if you do not know what the plant is, it's really better to go to a higher level ID, put it in as a plant or a, a flowering plant or in the sunflower family or whatever level you do know, rather than picking one of those species. One of the reasons is that if you identify it as a, a particular species and someone else comes along and clicks that agree button, it's suddenly research grade, even though neither one of you may have known what it really was. Now, another way that iNaturalist is not perfect is that research grade observations are correctly identified only about 85% of the time. Why is that? Well, I just talked about that agree button, and that's, that's one of the reasons of um, agreements to suggestions from the artificial intelligence, and the artificial intelligence was wrong, and so then the agree button gets clicked, and, and it's now research grade and wrong. There are other reasons. One that I find a lot for plants in San Diego is the common name um, trap, as I call it. There are, um, uh, there's, I'm sorry, the common name Pearly Everlasting is something that a lot of people use for plant in San Diego County. But on INAT, the plant that has the common name Pearly Everlasting is Annapolis Margaritacea, and that does not occur in our county. And yet you can see on the screenshot that when I made the screenshot, there were 15 observations of a plant that doesn't occur here, and most of them were research grade observations. And most of them were actually this plant, which on INAT is called California cudweed. So you can't rely on common names. They just are not standardized for plants. For birds and, and perhaps other things, they may be more standardized, but for plants, they are not at all standardized. And the way I deal with that, because I can't always remember uh, the scientific name, and if I can remember the scientific name, I might not be able to spell the scientific name, and if it's something like Pseudonaphallium, 
it may be hard to find it when you can't pronounce it or spell it. Um, so I keep a checklist of the plants of San Diego County uh, available to me when I'm doing identifications. It's available online and you can find a link to it on my profile page or I keep a field guide to plants of San Diego where I can check in that to be sure I've got the right scientific name before I click agree or before I add an identification. Otherwise, if you use the common name, there, I promise you, uh, you'll misidentify plants. And now I wanna talk just a little bit about projects. Um, there are lots and lots of projects on INAT. And there isn't a, a right or wrong project to be involved in. It really just depends on your own observations and what's appropriate for them. I think of it as a way to organize observations. Um, there are some very specialized projects. I like, for example, I like, um, I like, I like the lichen of Southern California project. So I, all my lichen observations, I add to the lichen project, that kind of thing. Um, there are three projects though that I want to specifically call out and encourage you all to take part in. This is uh, the Mission Trails Regional Park Biodiversity Project. It is the type of project that your observations, if they were taken within the park's boundaries, will automatically be added to the project. But if you join the project, that means then that you can get notifications of journal posts. So there may be information about the park or about plants and animals in the park that you would find interesting that you would find out about. It's also a place where you can go just to look through and see what other people are seeing in the park. Uh, you can see the most recent observations, what's been observed. You can look at all the species, for example, that have ever been observed in the park. And on the species page, they're ranked from the most observed going down to the least observed. And if you go here and you look at it, you see up in the upper left, the Western fence lizard is the most observed species in the park. And you can contemplate, why is that? And if you figure it out, let me know, because I've often wondered. Another project I hope you will participate in is the San Diego County Plant Atlas Project on INAT. This was set up by Dr. John Redman, the curator of botany at the Natural History Museum. It also automatically accumulates all the observations of plants within the county. But by joining the project, there are a couple of things that, that are important. One again is uh, notifications of journal posts. The, uh, the journal posts on this project are usually something to help you learn how to uh, identify plants. Uh, it may be comparing two similar species and telling you how to, to distinguish the two of them so that you can identify them. The other important thing about joining the Plant Atlas Project is that if you want your observations to be useful for science and to be part of what Dr. Regman pulls into the database that shows distribution of plants in San Diego County, he has to be able to have access to coordinates that are obscured. And to do for that to happen, you have to join the project and you have to make a specific selection in your settings. And you can do that when you join the project or if you have previously joined the project, you go to the project page and click on your membership. That then will take you to the page where there's a question that says, do you want to make your obscured coordinates available to the curators? And you have to say yes, no matter who adds the observation to the project. And if you do that, then all of your observations of plants in San Diego County will be useful um, for scientific purposes. And the last project that I want to mention is the City Nature Challenge. This is an annual competition. It says city, but for us, that means the County of San Diego. The next one will be April 30th to May 3rd of 2021. We don't know yet if the pandemic is going to impact this next year's um, challenge like it did last year, but hopefully there will be events around the uh, the City Nature Challenge that will be organized by the Natural History Museum. So you can watch their website after the first of the year for announcements about that. But I hope all of you will participate. And uh, every year, the observations in Mission Trails Regional Park are a big chunk of the observations for the City Nature Challenge. 
And I hope that you will set a couple of goals. One, that you will contribute a minimum of 100 observations over the four days of the challenge. 25 observations a day is very doable. And second, that you will do 100 identifications for the City Nature Challenge. And even if it's just that high level ID of going for the unknowns and uh, labeling them as a plant or mammal or whatever, that's very helpful so that then people who specialize in areas can go through quickly and make the identifications before the deadline for the end of the City Nature Challenge. I hope that going forward, all of you will really embrace the community of INAD and participate in it fully. Take ownership of your observations and make each one the best that it can be. Identify boldly but responsibly. And if you do, you will get the most from INAT. Now, this is where we were going to go for questions. I think that, um, well, it's already 6.45, so I think I will go ahead and um, switch over to the um, other screen so that we can, can do questions. Sorry, it takes me a moment to figure out the right things to click. It will take a minute or two for the questions to come up. And I will, um, in the meantime, I just want to mention that I know I've covered a lot this evening. There's still a lot about INAT that I didn't cover. I urge all of you to go to the website and just start clicking on all the menu options and, and looking at what you find. That, Going through it personally is the best way to become familiar with all the features on INAT. You won't break anything clicking on those buttons, so just do it, and, and I think you'll learn a lot that way. So here, the first question, may UTM coordinates be used or only latitude, longitude? I don't know, John. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what that means. Um, I, you know, I get the coordinates from my... Uh, from an app on my cell phone, and I know that the answer is available somewhere on the INAT website, and I'd be happy to find out for you, but I can't answer that one. So I hope somebody has a question I can answer. Is there some indicator that says if an observation will have its location obscured before posting? Is there a list or an icon? Well, there is an icon that shows up after you post, or at least a, uh, a legend that says obscured. Um, I don't know of any way that you can see that before. If you know what it is that you're posting, if you know what, what the organism is that you're posting, you can look on the, um, the taxon page for that organism on INAT and find out if it has up at the top right, they put if it's endangered or threatened, there's a little legend up at the top right by the species name. You can click on that and it then tells you where that designation comes from, like if it's from the US Fish and Wildlife Service endangered species list, or it's from the IUCN or what entity has designated it as a, a threatened or sensitive species. But before you, or while you're uploading, I'm not aware of any way that you can determine that um, for, for something that's in the process. It's only after the fact that you can see that. How do you know what the coordinates are if you have to put them in manually? You don't have to know the coordinates. You can just zoom in on the map and put your marker in the spot on the map where you made the observation, and the coordinates are generated automatically based on where you put the marker on the map. So you want to zoom in as far as you can, you know, make it get as close as you can, because if you're zoomed out too far, then you're, you, you will, you know, it's hard to put the marker precisely where you were, and you may be way off. But if you zoom way in, like if you're on a trail and you can zoom in so you actually see the trail and say, oh yeah, I was right before that sharp turn in the trail and you put your marker there, the, the, pro, um, 
INAT or Google Maps comes up with the coordinates for you and you don't have to worry about them. Okay, so when you record an observation in Mission Trails and the location says San Diego County and not the park, how do you override that? Well, unfortunately, the, the name given to the location is from Google Maps. It's not something INAT controls, um, so you can't do anything about it other than edit it. And you can edit the location for any observation when you're using the app, I think that's um, a little bit harder to do. I, I don't use the app myself a lot, so I, and I haven't tried to edit the location. But once the observation is uploaded, you can edit it. And at that point, you can change what it says as far as what the location is, as well as move your marker if you need to. One of the things that I see frequently is that Google Maps sometimes gives a really bizarre name to where they to where you were, even though the marker's in the right place. For example, if you post an observation near Kumeyaay Lake in the park, Google Maps says that's Lake Murray. And that just totally threw me off when I the first time I saw that on one of my observations and I thought, man, I'm losing it. I was sure I was at Kumeyaay Lake and it says I was at Lake Murray. Um, but that's because Google Maps is wrong, and I have tried to get Google to change that, and you submit a form, and they're supposed to respond, but they don't. So when looking for a specific species within a bounding box, does it automatically include obscured locations that may appear outside of the boundary? I do not think it does. Um, it, it depends. If that... Um, if that randomly placed um, dot from the, that I should, well, did, yeah, I got to show you that. If that's within your bounding box, even though it's an obscured location, the species will be included, but often uh, searches don't work for obscured spe uh, species with obscured locations. It also messes up projects that have geographic boundaries. Sometimes there'll be something with it that will be in the project that really shouldn't be because it was outside the boundaries of the project, but the obscuring puts it in the boundaries. So that is another thing that you have to be careful about in looking at where you think something is located. Um, if it's been obscured, it may totally throw you off. I believe I heard INAT only uses the first photo of a post to ID with. Is there any truth to that? Absolutely. That is what the computer vision does. It only looks at the very first photo. You can have eight photos or whatever, and it only looks at that first one. So you want to be sure to kind of put your best photo, the one that's most likely to show enough of the organism for it to be ID'd. Also, if you are wanting to get suggestions from the AI for the ID, one of the things that you can do is temporarily put your observations as, or excuse me, put each photo as a separate observation and see what the AI says for the different photos of the same thing. I do that sometimes just because I find it humorous almost to see what the AI says, and you'll get sometimes very different suggestions for the different photos, even though they're all of the same thing. In the app, what does the number next to the pink gray chevron signify? Oh boy, the pink gray chevron. I'm trying to think of a pink gray chevron. I'm, I'm picking up my phone here to to uh, look at the app so I can see if I can find that. And is the, I'm, can you say whether you're talking about in the process of uploading or after it's been uploaded? I'm not sure where the pink gray chevron is. I'm sorry. I'm, 
I'm at a loss. I, if somebody else knows what the answer to that question is, what's next to the pink, the number next to the pink or gray chevron. Okay, how do you get photos from your camera rather than your phone into iNAT? Okay, so if you can connect your camera to your computer and transfer your, your photos from your camera to your computer, you open iNaturalist website and there's an upload button on uh, the page, right up in the upper right area, uh, a green button that says upload. Sometimes it doesn't even say upload, it just shows, I think, an up arrow on it and you click that button and you get the upload screen. And then you just click and drag photos onto the screen and it creates an observation. And then you have to check to be sure that it has the time and date and you need to be sure the location is either added automatically or you need to add it by clicking in the location box. Anyway, you finish filling in the information for the observation. But it's basically very simple once you get your photos from your camera to your computer and get an upload screen open on iNAT, and then you just click and drag. Okay, on your own observations, which are the only ones that you can change a coordinate on, uh, it's not obscured for you. For you, you will always see your true coordinates of every observation, even if it's a sensitive organism, and for everyone else, your coordinates are obscured. They won't be obscured to you. If you're logged in as you and it's your observation, you'll be able to see the true coordinates and you can, you can edit them and change the location. And it will re-obscure the new location. Okay, so I think here we're getting an answer to one of the prior questions. Pink is when you have comments or IDs that you haven't looked at yet. After you open the observation in the app, it turns gray. Thank you very much, Cindy P. Um, that was not something that I was aware of, so thank you for answering that question. So anybody else? Here we go. How do folks like BJ Stacy and Jake Heller amass such an impressive observation species count? Well, they spend a whole lot of time. I don't think they sleep much. I, you know, I spend a lot of time and I'm way lower than they are. They were two of the earliest users of iNAT, so they've been at it longer than most of us have. Uh, but they just get out there and take lots of photos and spend lots of time. Um, uploading and um, participating on INAT. It's, it's a really almost a full-time thing for them, I think, although they both have jobs in addition to it. Okay, I think we're going to finish now with the questions, and I want to thank you all again for joining me tonight. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer, and uh, she will do the close. Hi there. Um, thanks so much, Millie, for the great um, tutorial. And we're really excited to get out on the trail and make some more observations um, at Mission Trails or wherever you are, even in your backyard is fine. Um, wanted to remind folks that we have another lecture coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, it's on November 19th with Wendy Esterly. And she's going to be talking about the wildlife and birds of Mission Trails. And this uh, Wendy's talk will not be recorded. So if you'd like to participate, um, mark your calendar for Thursday, November 19th, and please register. We'll be sending out a link for that um, just in the next couple of days and also as a follow-up to this presentation. Um, also, we, are, we did archive or we will archive this presentation. So if you have any questions or would like to, to uh, go back and, and hear more of, of Millie's you know, tips on how to best use INAT, um, it will be on our YouTube channel. So thanks so much for uh, joining us tonight and uh, take care. Bye-bye.